she told me that in 1954, when the Brown v. Board decision came and she saw the reaction that it provoked, she realized that the world she'd grown up with, this kind of rural, black and white world of Neshoba County, was about to change. So she bought herself a camera, built a homemade darkroom in an upstairs hallway, and started to take thousands of pictures, determined to document this rural order that she knew was about to disappear. After the murders happened in 1964, I mean, part of what made them so notorious nationally was not just the fact that two of the victims were white, but it was also the way in which so many people in Neshoba County contrived to live down to every northern stereotype about white recalcitrants. They refused to cooperate with the FBI. They heckled people searching for the bodies. They assaulted journalists who were covering the case. Very few people in the town were willing to speak out and condemn the murders. Even people who certainly knew and believed that what had happened was wrong. And Florence Mars was just one of the few who did. She cooperated with the FBI. She spoke with community leaders, urging them to speak out. She testified in a federal trial that exposed the vicious treatment of local black people by authorities. And ultimately, she paid a price for that. Did she use any of her photographs in her testimony to illustrate life in Neshoba County? No. She just basically tried to rally people in her community to speak out, to do the right thing. She, for example, started a fund to rebuild the Mount Zion church that had been burned, which was the reason the three civil rights workers were there in any case. That was the kind of work she was doing. But in that context, it was very threatening to a lot of people. They accused her of being an FBI agent or of working for the civil rights organization. And she was ostracized. They forced her to shutter her business. They even fired her from her job teaching Sunday school in order that she wouldn't influence other young people. It seems that there are those direct on photos, primarily of the African-Americans, but the pictures of white people seem to be taken without them knowing about it. I think there certainly are some candid photos in the collection. And I think you're right. More of those photos are of white people. And it, it's interesting to speculate why she was able, it seems, to develop a kind of bond of trust and intimacy with the black people that she was photographing, whereas many of the photos of white people do have a more fugitive cast, as if somehow they're less comfortable being photographed. I don't know. I mean, probably 80 percent or more of the photos in the book are of black Mississippians. But that's a very good observation. I think more of the white photographs have a fugitive aspect. There was one that I just really can't shake, and that was of a black man in black face, seemingly entertaining Absolutely. four white men. Yep. He's got that big white clown makeup around his mouth. It just comes across as very degrading, and the white men are smiling and laughing at him. There's a history here. Blackface is the premier form of popular entertainment in the United States for most of the 19th century. And the performers who undertake it are not just white people, but black people. The last touring blackface minstrel troupe in the United States is a Mississippi-based troupe called the Rabbit's Foot Minstrels. They're founded in the early 20th century, and they tour through the 1950s. And the performers and the owners of the troupe are black. Florence Mars and an artist friend of hers, Ralston Crawford, set out on an expedition in 1955 to find them, to find and photograph the last touring blackface minstrel troupe in the United States. There are several of those photos in her collection, one of which is in the book. It's an absolutely harrowing picture of a black man in burnt cork with exaggerated white painted lips, kind of imagining or performing a kind of imagined black world for the amusement of a white crowd. It's quite a photograph. What historical perspective is most significant, do you think, from this book? Part of what I found very moving about the book is just the way in which it reminds us not only of the kind of extraordinary human capacity 
for dignity and for living lives of meaning and purpose, even in contexts of utter oppression, because the, the people in her photographs, they're living in circumstances of great poverty and violence, but they're also people of such transparent dignity and strength and resiliency. And I think that's, in some ways, the most compelling message of the entire book. There's a photo in the collection that haunts me. It's a photo of a black woman, clearly a domestic worker, bathing a small naked white child who's standing in a galvanized bucket on a porch. And Mars printed that photo over and over. And on the back of one of them, she had penciled a caption, certain things are seen to be self-evident. In other words, this is part of the world that I live in that most people never trouble to see. And I think her questions ask us to wonder what is self-evident in our own world? What are we choosing not to see? And what are the consequences if we trouble to see? James T. Campbell is the co-editor with Elaine Owens and the author of the introductory essay for Mississippi Witness, The Photographs of Florence Mars. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks so much for having me.